Armenia's capital, Yerevan, has become a migration hotspot for Russians in the space of just a few short months. They are often young, well-off intellectuals and entrepreneurs who fear being forced to fight in Ukraine and want to escape President Putin's Russia. Around 300,000 Russians have settled in this small country of three million inhabitants. Daria and her husband arrived nine months ago. For them and their US-backed pacifist NGO, St. Petersburg had become a place where they had no freedom and was even dangerous. They decided to flee and Armenia welcomed them with open arms. This morning, they are visiting a flat in one of the city's nicer neighborhoods. They can afford it. It's so different from St. Petersburg, but we want to understand how to live in Armenian and to push it on in Armenian uh, design, maybe. Something beautiful, I guess. Yeah. More than correct price. Uh, we have uh, 2,000. And uh, this apartment uh, cost uh, 1,000. That's why it's so cheap uh, price at the center of, of uh, the city. Rent here is much cheaper than in big cities in Russia. They have no intention of returning home anytime soon. Uh, we know that what goes around comes around, but uh, at this time we are trying to find the, the apartments and our lives at this place. The estate agent is glad of this influx of cash from Russian newcomers. But on the flip side, Armenians are being outpriced and pushed to the outskirts of the city. Collateral damage. With the thousands of dollars they received from their pacifist American organization, Daria and her husband won't have much trouble blending in in the capital's wealthy neighborhoods. Of course, not all Russians are so well off. Daniel is 19 and fled the general mobilization declared by Putin at the end of September. He arrived a few days ago. Right now I don't have any salary and uh, I don't have any money to exchange, so... I can't really buy anything here, not any, any of the food, not any of the fruits and etc. But uh, I still have my photo camera with me, so uh, I think it's a really nice place to take some photos. Daniel is still a little lost, but wandering around the city, he stumbles upon familiar territory. The Komitas market is just like the markets back in Moscow. That's a nice place. <laughs> I suppose it was built like in Soviet Union, probably, something like this. I think it's this visual language that I have uh, to communicate with people through photos and uh, to tell stories, because I don't really like talking about myself. Daniel isn't completely isolated. He has a phone and can call his mom back home. Hello. Я получил мам деньги. Нет, мам, меня никто не обижает, не переживай. Короче, всё хорошо. Хорошо, давай, пока-пока. Давай, пока-пока. Хорошего дня. Давай. Daniel just moved here. He's 30 minutes away from the city center. So, as you can see, something, <laughs> something's not right. And uh, you, can, you can smell here that it's not really, really wonderful. <laughs> this is the apartment that I rent. Uh, it's a small apartment and uh, I pay for it 
220,000 drums. I'm a part Ukrainian, part Russian. So uh, it was a really strange statement for my mother to say, as if like people at Ukraine are bad, they sh you should kill them. Because, I mean, you have left uh, with, my, with my father for 20 years. How can you say some, some things like this? So when the mobilization started on 21st of, uh, of September, when Putin announced it, I was feeling really scared. I was, um, I was going crazy. So on the 24th of September, my girlfriend Sasha, she, she goes like, hey, here is 100,000 rubles to you from me. Please, can you, can you leave this country right now? And uh, this was a really huge uh, gesture to me. And uh, I, was, I wasn't, it's like, this is true love that I felt uh, from her because uh, no one had ever done something for me like this. A nice gesture, but it wasn't enough. The few flights available from Moscow cost thousands of euros. Daniel gathered his few belongings and left the next day in a hurry for Kazakhstan. Later, through sheer luck, he was able to carry on his journey to Yerevan. Pyotr's departure from Moscow, on the other hand, was meticulously organized. The 38-year-old entrepreneur has never been able to stand Putin. So he moved his entire life to Armenia, even buying a car, a vintage Russian Zhiguli. Pyotr also plays ice hockey three times a week, just like he did in Moscow. This way, he gets to indulge his nostalgia for the cold weather, experience the joy of the game, and feel a sense of team spirit, even if his teammates are a little unusual. There are multiple FSB agents at the ice rink. Putin's men are here due to the defense agreements between Yerevan and the Kremlin. Russia imposed a ceasefire between Armenia and Azerbaijan, two years ago. The war killed 6,000 people in 44 days. Discussing politics is taboo for them. Experts here may enjoy relative freedom, but must still toe the line. In Moscow, Pyotr manages several companies with a hundred employees in fields as varied as food and sports sponsorship. But from now on, he'll manage them by email or by phone from his small offices in Armenia. Утром скажут здравствуйте, мы тут вам повестку принесли. Dun -dun -dun. Так. Up until a year ago, this wealthy businessman was an activist in the Russian Communist Party, one of the few opposition parties that still exists legally in the country. Устав этой партии противоречит моим жизненным ценностям на 90%. Лишь 10 там совпадают с моим видением жизни. Но мне важна была Любая оппозиционная платформа, э, легальная, в стране, задокументированная, чтобы я мог э, находиться в противостоянии с тем режимом и с той властью, которая есть в нашей стране. Поэтому, э, наверное, я ультралевый, э, ультралевый социалист с капиталистическим наклоном, если можно так сказать. Sausage manufacturing is an easy process to export. Нет вкуснее колбасы, чем из каменной печи. 
Мы хотим э, интегрироваться в экономику Армении. Большая часть людей, проживающих на территории Армении, в Ереване в частности, очень хорошо относятся к русским. И русские продукты пользуются спросом и популярностью. Не все российское означает тире Путин. Пьотр не волнуется о его This is the suburb of Norkmarash, another district of the capital. This morning, Vasily and his housemates have a lot of tidying up to do. They have to leave the place in a few days because the building manager has just doubled the rent. Moving house like this has become a routine procedure for Vasily and his friends. This is the seventh time he's had to move. His landlady swears she doesn't know anything about the rent increase. Apparently it's the agency's fault, but she doesn't necessarily see it as a problem. <laughs> Vasily is under no illusions about Armenian-Russian friendships. But here, he feels safe from the threat of being rounded up for conscription or arrested for some form of wrongdoing. In his native Siberia, the cemeteries are full of opponents of the regime. In Armenia, at least he can think in peace. Sasha, a fierce opponent of Putin, lives with seven other people in Yerevan. They have regular water cuts, but prefer to laugh about it. Sasha was a fashion journalist in Moscow. She saw her job as completely incompatible with the war and decided to leave. She works for a large online jewelry store in Moscow, but she's also thrown herself into humanitarian work. Her social media know-how has helped her to raise money for victims of the war on both sides of the conflict. Пишут, что у них закончилось на складе или что в чем больше нуждаются беженцы, и они публикуют список, и перед тем, как ехать за помощью, мы, ну, я проверяю эти списки, составляю таблицы, исходя из того, сколько денег у нас есть. Детское шампунь, мыло и зубная паста по 4. Значит, детских 4. Каждая поездка в центр у нас обходится где-то в 15 тысяч рублей. We have some rules, because uh, we try not to buy Russian products, because firstly, because of economic reason. The second one, it, it could be um, like trigger for Ukrainians if they see some Russian language. The pair are heading to a Ukrainian refugee center. Sasha posts everything she does online. A full shopping cart is concrete evidence that shows donors where their money is going. This is a new approach in Armenia, but it's fast becoming a useful way of helping all people in need.
Among them are Armenians displaced by the Nagorno-Karabakh war with neighboring Azerbaijan. Today, she's found a car to get out of the capital. She and her friends are planning to bring food to people in need in the village of Ararat, at the foot of a legendary mountain of the same name. They're not far from the crossroads of death, the border between Turkey, Iran, Azerbaijan and Armenia, closely watched by the Russian army. It's a complex region which Sasha has learned to love. Армения стала мне домом, и я должна знать и понимать, как выглядит армянское сообщество, какие проблемы здесь есть, не только со стороны человека, который иммигрировал, но и изнутри. Bonds are quickly formed during difficult times. Она благодарит вас за то, что в вашей стране война, но вы делитесь добром людям. Помогайте нашим армянским женщинам, семьям, как говорится. Большое вам спасибо, низкий поклон за вас. In Armenia, hospitality is practically a religion. Even those who don't have a lot know how to generously thank their guests. Back in Yerevan, Pyotr and his wife have found a school for their 11-year-old son, Kirill. It's a free public school where classes are in Russian, open to all children who have at least one Russian parent. Kirill is happy here. His parents have no doubt Kirill will never return to a school in Moscow. He'll be much happier in his family's beautiful flat, far from his native Russia. Все умы уехали. Все, кто могли что-то сказать, все, кто на кого можно было нацелить свой взгляд, они все разъехались из страны. Поэтому тяжелое, очень тяжелое будущее будет в России. На ближайшую перспективу 10-20 лет я вижу очень большую проблему. Поэтому я не вижу будущего своего ребенка там. Именно это, это и стало одной из причин уезда. Сюда и доставай, что там тебе. Но мы уже почти выучили. Очень хочу, чтобы Россия проиграла в этой войне, а, именно на поле боя, чтобы люди, проживающие в этой стране, поняли а, в России, чтобы они поняли, что есть, во-первых, силы другие на этой планете, это первое, и во-вторых, чтобы они поняли, что а, век империи закончен, есть век открытого мира. Vika and her husband arrived a few days after the outbreak of the war with Ukraine and are now living in this chic building in the center. Vika has Ukrainian roots. A few days ago, her grandmother Lyudmila, who was born in Zaporizhia, also arrived from Moscow. She was feeling lonely and sad. <laughs> The couple respect her silence and enjoy her presence and culinary skills. <laughs> now she cooks us a real Ukrainian borscht, which I missed a lot because I haven't been in Russia for eight months and I haven't eaten borscht. <laughs> In Moscow, Vika used to run an animal welfare charity. Now that she was safe and comfortable, she quickly realized she had to do something else. The mass arrival of wealthy Russians like her has caused prices to soar, flats are becoming scarce, and some exiles consider their hosts to be a bit provincial, which is already beginning to cause tension. Me and Marusi were thinking about something charitable and useful for this 
uh, country for this location and it turned out that it could be some integrational projects, cultural, cultural integration for migrants, I guess. They regularly organize meetings and conferences to talk about Armenia to Russian immigrants and Russian culture to Armenians. Tonight, they are putting on a show so people can experience the great music of their country. But in the meantime, it's time to appreciate her grandmother's borscht. The night has just begun at Aesthetic Joy's embassy. This is a new, trendy bar for Russians. It was thanks to this night spot that Danielle was able to flee Kazakhstan. One of the owners, Ilya, offered him the job of social media manager. Ilya is the son of an oligarch close to Putin, but he welcomes anyone who criticizes or shuns him. I have seen many people arriving with their suitcases, which means that they're arriving somewhere from the airport and they're coming here at the first place. So many people were coming here, finding their, making new connections, uh, finding where they can rent, um, and all this kind of stuff. So we became already pretty useful. Daniel is creating a network for people who have been uprooted. The bar offers them comfort and company. This golden youth in exile has found its place. There will be music and drinks all night long. Sasha's friends can't afford to go out in the city every night. They prefer to invite friends over, including Danielle. Everyone is happy to be able to sit down and talk about everything together. Of course, we've seen there were different stories in this, inside of this diaspora. They're all great and they all escaped the war and there is something that's unite, that unites them and everybody's seeking for attention and seeking to, for coming towards each other. <laughs> they rely on their friendships to forge a life for themselves here. They can't imagine any change happening in Russia that could tempt them to return. К сожалению, ни одна революция не совершается левой интеллигенцией. Нужны радикальные силы. Но сейчас у нас их нет. Они либо в тюрьме, либо либо на верхнем ларсе вот. А вы что? To end their evening, they are playing a card game that's very popular in Russia. It's called the Moron, a discreet reference to the person who led them to seek refuge here. Back in the city, Vika and her friend Marussia have organized a charity concert to help veterans of another war, the one in Nagorno-Karabakh. They've invited a Russian pianist and an Armenian cellist to play to symbolize the friendship between the two. We have sold hundreds, 120 tickets, I guess. And uh, also it's great that the um, public is mixed, Armenian and Russian, Moscow and Yerevan people, and we like it so much. So maybe it could be a center of something happening, like a place for Russian diaspora. There's still a lot of work to do. But as locals and exiles build bridges and share cultures, they cement Armenia's newfound status as a safe haven.